Britain out of the European Union. But then he saw his leadership bid and cabinet career end amid recriminations over his spectacular falling out with Boris Johnson. Michael Gove still thinks, however, that he has something to offer Westminster, and he's been elected to serve on the Brexit Select Committee. Earlier this morning, I reflected with him on the moment Boris Johnson abandoned his bid for number 10. Let us seize this chance and make this our moment to stand tall in the world. That is the agenda for the next Prime Minister of this country. But I must tell you, my friends, you who have waited faithfully for the punchline of this speech, that having consulted colleagues and in view of the circumstances in Parliament, I have concluded that person cannot be me. So, uh, Michael Gosey, how, how did you feel when you saw that? I don't know, did you watch it? I didn't watch it, but I heard about it. I was, I was uh, surprised that Boris had decided to withdraw, actually, at the time. I mean, you were the man, effectively, who brought it about, weren't you, going from his campaign manager to his rival? Um, I think that there were a, a number of factors at work there, but it was certainly the case that my decision not to support Boris at the end, but to run myself, that obviously changed the dynamic of the leadership election. Um, and then, at the end of that process, we found that uh, Boris was Foreign Secretary, I was on the back benches, but now that I am yeah. on the back benches, I've got an opportunity to contribute to the debate about how well, Britain can uh, shape its future in the European Union. But there was a certain amount of uh, treachery there, wasn't there? I mean, people supporting you like Nick Bowles, taking away Boris's phones, not passing on his messages, uh, conspiring with you uh, to draw up lists of supporters. No. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that um, that characterization of things is, is wrong. I think that um, uh, the, the way in which the decision was taken um, was inevitably difficult, but um, uh, the the way in which you've uh, uh, constructed the narrative, I don't think is well. So you, so you don't think that there was betrayal on your your part? I think a decision was taken by me um, after uh, you'd taken a previous decision to support Boris. Uh, yes, and I, I've uh, explained um, before, and I'm happy to confirm yeah. again to you that um, I made a mistake. I should either have paused before uh, supporting Boris in the way that I did, or having agreed to support Boris, um, that I should have stuck with it. And the final thing that I've said. Um, is that having uh, made that decision um, uh, not to support him but to run myself, I should probably have presented my case in a different way to the way that I did. I mean, but in the end, uh, a verdict was passed, a very clear verdict by my parliamentary colleagues, some of whom were good enough to vote for me, but the majority of whom voted obviously I mean, do you think Theresa. that was the biggest mistake you made, thinking that you were the best person to be Prime Minister when the Tory party apparently thought even Andrew Leadsom would be better? Um, I think that uh, Andrew did very well during the leadership campaign, and of course, uh, yeah. having. Um, but you did. I mean, you made that speech. I mean, you must feel a prize idiot, really, to make that speech, saying I'm the best person to lead the country, and then your own MPs don't back you. Well, 48 people did back me, and I think by definition, so it's third. Hmm? That's coming third. That third out of five. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So do you feel that that was a foolish miscalculation? Well, it was a mistake, wasn't it? So it was a mistake. But was that the biggest mistake? Was it supporting Boris, knifing Boris, or thinking you were fit to be Prime Minister? What was the, what was the worst mistake? Oh, I, I don't know. I, mean, I think overall it was a mistake. But the thing I did manage to get right um, was to uh, argue that we should leave the European Union. Yeah. Um, and 17.4 million people agreed with me. Sure. Um, and uh, therefore, we now have, as politicians, an obligation to honour that decision, to respect it, and to implement but it. But it. I mean, it must be frustrating for you that you were one of the architects of that. You were one of the key swing figures, if you like, at the top of British politics. And yet you're now excluded from the table uh, as the government tries to negotiate it. Well, I'm, it, it's kind of you to attribute to me um, uh, being a key swing uh, figure in the, in the referendum campaign. And certainly I, um, I felt that uh, during that referendum campaign, lots of people in uh, Westminster found that their view of what the country yeah. uh, believed was, was wrong. And I'm, I'm glad that I was um, uh, as a, a figure, I wouldn't say a significant figure, but a figure who played a part in that. But also, um, I think the most important thing in, in politics is to uh, respect what the voters tell you um, and to seek to implement it. And there were two sets of voters who came to a conclusion. Uh, there were Conservative MPs who decided that Theresa should be Prime Minister, and I respect that decision and I think she's doing a good job. And there were the British voters who decided that we should leave the European Union. And now I'm working with Maurice Glassman, my friend, a Labour peer, 
in order to make sure that we uh, implement uh, leaving the European Union in a way that chimes with the, the verdict that the British but people as, recorded. But as you pointed out, uh, Boris Johnson is the Foreign Secretary. Yeah? Yes. He, he has a great deal more influence than you, presumably, in all of this. Uh, he absolutely does, yes. So that was another cunning plan that misfired, if you like. Well, I'm, I'm very happy that Boris is um, a Foreign Secretary. I think that he's a, a talented figure. Um, but of course, I, I lost. And, you know, there you go. And I think yeah. the thing is that if you yeah. are defeated in any election, then you should accept the result with good grace. And my concern is that some of those who were on the, the losing side in the referendum aren't accepting uh, that verdict with good grace. One of the who, things that who, I want... Who do you think of in that? Because most of the ones I talk to say, well, we accept the, the vote. The I know, but there are lots of people who are, uh, are trying, some of them under the, the banner of an organisation called... I mean, there is an element, isn't there, of sort of going out and bayonetting the wounded after this. And, you know, we've seen it in your columns. You know, you've been gloating about the performance of the economy. You've gone after Mark Carney and, and, and others. No, I'm, I'm not bayoneting anyone, and I certainly wouldn't gloat. All I would do, and have done, um, is point out, firstly, that there were lots of people during the, uh, the run-up to the uh, uh, referendum uh, who said that Britain's economy would uh, be plunged into recession. That hasn't happened. There were lots of people who said that uh, we would see a flight of capital from this country. That hasn't happened. I think in the papers today, GlaxoSmithKline are recording uh, a... Losing 30% of its value, which is not generally an international vote of confidence in our currency. Well, it has actually helped boost our economy. There are some people, including the uh, former governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, who argued that sterling was overvalued beforehand, and it's certainly given a competitive edge to our economy. But there were lots of commentators, yeah. yourself included, Adam, who were um, you know, understandably fearful about the consequences of yeah, no, our I leaving the European Union. And it's actually turned out, I, I hope you'll acknowledge, uh, rather better than I you predicted. I think there's some pluses and minuses, but overall... But would you acknowledge overall, that you made overall, a mistake? Overall, I think there's going to be an economic cost of Brexit, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Okay. But would you acknowledge that you made a mistake during the referendum campaign and that you called some things wrong? Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely, but I, I mean, I wasn't running for office. I was uh, just commentating. But I mean, no, but you know, we all live in there. No, I got, I got some things wrong. Yeah. I, I mean, I was surprised by the final result. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, your colleague Dominic Cummings told me emphatically that if the UK voted to come out, mm. Scotland would also vote to come out. Scotland voted 60% to remain in, and as a result, mm. one of the unforeseen consequences is a big cleft in the uh, UK, isn't it? Well, it's certainly the case that the SNP are trying to uh, generate, as they always do, that's their, their purpose, yeah, but, I mean, generate division. Well, you've just said you should listen to the voters. 60% of the Scottish voters want to uh, stay in the European Union. Uh, yes, but overall, the unit that voted was the United Kingdom. There are some constituencies, um, uh, including in Scotland, that voted to remain. There are others that voted to leave, including Ed Miliband's. Ed Miliband's voted by, you know, over 70%. Uh, Ed whom I respect, formidable politician, is nevertheless trying to say that we should uh, stay in the single market and he's trying to yeah. uh, chip away yeah. at that mandate. Well, let, let's that, that's fair enough. That's a conversation, an argument right. we can have. Well, but I think that Ed and others uh, should respect yeah. that decision. But do you think the answer is hard Brexit, no single market, no customs union? Um, I, I, hard Brexit is a phrase that's used in order to try to uh, make what is a liberation seem like a punishment. But I do believe that we should be outside the single market Absolutely, and that's what people voted and for. And outside the customs union. I think that's probably going to have to be the case as well. I mean, yes. they also voted for all that money going to the health service every week, which clearly isn't going to happen. That was a lie, wasn't it? Uh, it certainly was not. Um, that is the uh, accurate figure for the amount of money that the European Union controls. Um, and I myself am in favour of increased NHS spending. But um, since I'm not the health secretary or the chancellor of the Exchequer, mm. I can't deliver that yet. But we may be able to deliver your that when we group, leave. Your new group is going to focus on immigration. We, we um, understand uh, that. A range of issues, but that's long, the first long one. Been a, uh, yeah. Obsession, if you like, over Lord Glassman to a certain extent. How low is low, in your view? I mean, what, how low should net migration into this country be? Well, the, the purpose of the Commission is to ask the voters, to ask British citizens how they want our immigration system to work. I've got some, some broad principles, but I think it's uh, properly respectful for me to outline what those principles are and then to listen in a conversation to what people say. And my first principle is that we should have a fair migration policy so that we shouldn't discriminate in favour of any particular set of countries. And, uh, I mean, would you support the less than 100,000, for example? Well, I think it's important that uh, uh, eventually Parliament decides and then we can have a vote at the next election on it. Um, the Prime Minister wants to bring it down to, to that level. I can completely understand why. But at this stage, uh, my view is let's have a broad debate about uh, what our economy needs and also what we need to do in order to help uh, refugees. And then let's come to a conclusion then. So I wouldn't want to preempt uh, the result of, of, of the conversation that 
uh, Maurice Glassman and I wants to have with, um, with voters. And as someone who's uh, focused quite a lot on education, do you think that students should be included or omitted from any target? I've got an open mind on that. So in that sense, you're closer to Philip May, perhaps, than uh, Mrs. Uh, to Philip Hammond than you are to Mrs. May. Well, I have an open mind. I mean, uh, part of the purpose of, um, I, as I say, this conversation is to say, how can we construct an, uh, uh, an immigration policy that allows people to come here to study and to work, but in numbers that we control and that we can benefit from? And uh, if, you, if you are embarking on a policy commission and the mm. explicit you know, mm. role of that policy commission is to listen, then you can't have all the answers right at the beginning. You can't have that, but at the same time, you know, you listen to universities around the country, they are really crying out in pain at the, the consequence, the economic consequences of all this for them. Well, there, there are, you know, there are swings and roundabouts. I mean, I think that there are certain opportunities that universities have, not least uh, to get more money from uh, foreign students when some of the rules change, but ultimately, we need to ensure that we have uh, a migration system that allows people who genuinely want to come here to study um, and whom universities can, in all conscience, offer a, a proper place to, to come here. But we obviously need to be in a position where there's democratic control over that process. So a lot still to be heard from you. Thanks very much, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right, fun. This is All Out Politics, coming up next. <laughs>